We're back again with our OBGYN lectures. This talk is going to be on dysmenorrhea. So dys meaning painful, menorrhea being menstrual flow. So painful menstrual flow, painful menses. And this is a cause of chronic or uh, cyclical chronic pelvic pain in women uh, of reproductive age. So this is the most common cause of pelvic pain, of cyclical pelvic pain in women of reproductive age. Uh, you'll run into this quite often. So a 17-year-old girl comes in to your clinic complaining of crampy lower abdominal and pelvic pain with her periods over the last year. The pain predictably comes the day before she gets her period, when she starts bleeding, and it lasts about three or four days, and it's completely gone by the time it stops bleeding. Right now, she's presently having some lower abdominal pelvic pain. She rates it as a plus 4 out of 10. She also tells you that her last period was 4 weeks ago, and she says that she's a virgin and has no history of STDs. Physical exam is remarkable for mild lower abdominal uh, pain to palpation, no rebound or guarding. Pelvic exam is unremarkable. So what do we do with this patient? What is our best next step in the management of this patient? And you will run into this question on the test. Even though she says she's a virgin, this goes for any woman of reproductive age. If she comes in with abdominal pain, your next step is going to be pregnancy test. So we're going to get a urine qualitative HCG, and that is negative. And the reason why we want to get a pregnancy test is not only because we want to know, is this a pregnancy? Is this an ectopic pregnancy? But even if it were, of course, we're going to treat her pain, and we want to know uh, if she's pregnant, because if she is pregnant, we want to avoid NSAIDs. Now, that said, giving NSAIDs very, very, very early on in pregnancy is probably not going to be a big deal. Uh, that's more of a problem to give NSAIDs later in the pregnancy, but NSAIDs are contraindicated during pregnancy anyway. So we don't want to give NSAIDs if she's pregnant. That said, we know she's not pregnant. The most likely diagnosis here is primary dysmenorrhea. And the reason we can presume that diagnosis is because she doesn't have any other associated symptoms with the pain. This is solely menstrual pain. Now, if the question or the scenario uh, had resulted in her having a mass or that she had associated symptoms like diarrhea or constipation, or if she, the physical exam was remarkable for a fixed retroverted uterus and uterosacral nodularity, then we would want to look into alternative diagnoses. But in this case, this is pretty straightforward primary dysmenorrhea, and it's common for it to present for the first time in a younger woman. It's not very common to present for the first time in a woman over the age of 25. Uh, so 17 would be right around the age we would expect it to show up. Okay, so uh, about six years ago, I was uh, vacationing in Europe and went to Valais in Switzerland, and I visited a, a monastery uh, that was open to the public, and it happened to be uh, dedicated to St. Maurice, who was a 3rd century uh, Roman legionnaire, headed the Roman Theban uh, army, and uh, it was told to me that this saint has been traditionally prayed to, uh, invoked by women who have painful periods. Uh, so how we came from an association uh, of, of this uh, legionnaire, this, this warrior, how he came to be associated with menstrual cramping, I wasn't able to get an answer. Uh, but that is the legend behind St. Maurice. Okay, dysmenorrhea. One of the most common causes of chronic pelvic pain in a woman of reproductive age, if not the most common cause of chronic pelvic pain. Now, dysmenorrhea is an umbrella term. And when we're talking about dysmenorrhea in this lecture, we're talking about primary dysmenorrhea. Because there are lots of things that we've already talked about, like endometriosis, fibroids, that can cause chronic cyclical pelvic pain. Definitely endometriosis. You get pain with your periods. Uh, that is a common cause of dysmenorrhea, but that's a secondary dysmenorrhea. We're going to talk about primary dysmenorrhea going forward here. 
So dysmenorrhea is a cause of cyclical pelvic pain. It comes and goes in predictable intervals, which may be known or unbeknownst to the patient. And so it's very important when a woman says that she has pain that comes and goes, you want to know how often does it come and go. Because if it comes and goes every month, then we're looking at a, uh, a dysmenorrhea situation. Most women will know. I have pain with my periods. I have my periods and I've got this awful pelvic pain that comes with it. So you won't need to do a whole lot of probing just as a matter of practicality. Dysmenorrhea, as mentioned, can be primary or secondary. So primary dysmenorrhea is like we had in this vignette. It's cyclical menstrual pain with no identifiable underlying cause. This is a diagnosis of exclusion, so we always need to rule out secondary causes like endometriosis, adenomyosis, fibroids, etc. Uh, before we render a diagnosis of primary dysmenorrhea. We also need to rule out pregnancy as well. Uh, so secondary dysmenorrhea is cyclical menstrual pain with an underlying cause. There are a lot of causes of chronic pelvic pain. Uh, so you go down the list here, lots and lots and lots of things can cause chronic pelvic pain. That is why you want to know, is this pelvic pain cyclical? Does it come and go in predictable intervals? Because if you can identify this as a chronic cyclical pelvic pain, you've narrowed your differential down quite significantly, down to endometriosis, um, adenomyosis, leiomyoma, uh, dysmenorrhea, uh, maybe uh, a, uh, a mild torsion. Um, and so uh, if you know that it's cyclical, then you can you, you really help yourself. Otherwise, uh, then uh, you have quite a wide differential. Another thing uh, you, you can uh, if you get uh, a if you have an obstruction of the uh, of the the outlet, the, the cervical outlet, if there's an obstruction there, that can cause a cyclical pelvic pain uh, as well. So lots of different causes of pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain, but if you can get this narrowed down uh, that this is a cyclical pelvic pain, then you're well on your way to rendering a diagnosis. Physical exam will be very, uh, very useful to you. So lots and lots of causes. Don't worry about memorizing all these. Uh, the ones in the red are the ones that are more uh, important for the test, in my opinion. Okay, so the risk factors for primary dysmenorrhea include an earlier age at menarche. Can't explain that, I don't know why. Longer menstrual periods. Not sure why here, but my inclination is that women who have primary dysmenorrhea and have longer menstrual periods, they're going to have more days of pain and therefore they're going to be more likely to come in and ultimately be diagnosed. That's what I think. Higher BMI, smoking, and then uh, we do know that parity appears to be associated with a decreased incidence of primary dysmenorrhea. Do not know why. I'm, I, I really don't know why uh, these risk factors are what they are, uh, but that's what you have. So the pathophysiology, uh, we know that endometrial cells release prostaglandins, and so when they begin to die off and they release all these prostaglandins, uh, the prostaglandins stimulate myometrial contraction, and they also incite ischemia. They cause ischemia of the, uh, by causing constriction of the spiral arteries. This leads to ischemia and death of the endometrial cell lining. Uh, and this is all instigated by that progesterone withdrawal when the corpus luteum involutes. Uh, so... You have these prostaglandins, and the prostaglandins, uh, they stimulate the myometrial contractions. They help get that lining out, but these prostaglandins also cause pain. Prostaglandins are painful, and that goes for anywhere. Anywhere you have prostaglandins, like an inflammation, you're going to have an associated pain. And what is thought is that women with primary dysmenorrhea appear to release higher levels of prostaglandins than women who don't have the diagnosis of primary dysmenorrhea. So 
that that's what we think is behind why some women uh, are more likely to have painful periods than other women. So comparing primary to secondary dysmenorrhea, primary dysmenorrhea tends to have an earlier age of onset, 16 to 25 years. The onset of pain comes just prior to menses, whereas with secondary dysmenorrhea, a lot of times uh, it will uh, be a longer duration of pain. Uh, primary dysmenorrhea usually only lasts three, four, five days. The symptoms of primary dysmenorrhea, when you have a patient coming in and you do a review of systems and you ask, what do you have right now? Women with primary dysmenorrhea will tell you they have pain and you're not going to get a whole lot else from them. For secondary dysmenorrhea, a lot of times there will be other symptoms present. So, for instance, if they have a mass, maybe they'll say they feel uh, have a feeling of pelvic fullness. Maybe they'll say they have some associated diarrhea. Or maybe they'll say they have mood swings. Or maybe they'll say uh, they get uh, short of breath or something like that. There'll be other symptoms present. Uh, and that's going to point you towards a secondary cause. Response. So when we treat a woman with primary dysmenorrhea, they should respond to NSAIDs or combined oral contraceptives. A woman with secondary dysmenorrhea either won't respond or she won't respond sufficiently uh, with NSAIDs and combined oral contraceptives. That said, uh, some women, let's say for instance with endometriosis, they will respond well to NSAIDs or combined oral contraceptives, but it's important that you recognize the other factors that will point you towards endometriosis. Uh, because if you just treat their symptoms, but you don't diagnose the underlying cause, uh, you haven't really done that woman a whole lot of a favor. Uh, and as you can imagine, with primary dysmenorrhea, physical exam will be unremarkable. Whereas with secondary dysmenorrhea, it depends on the cause, but a lot of them, there will be uh, something on physical examination that will point you towards that. The number one cause of secondary dysmenorrhea is endometriosis. So we look for history of infertility. We look for pain during intercourse, uterosacral nodularity, fixed, retro, or fixed retroverted uterus. Uh, things like that will make you suspect endometriosis. And endometriosis, the symptoms of that, can come on at any time. Usually a little bit earlier in life, but... Uh, Really, any time it can, it can show up. So you should suspect the secondary dysmenorrhea in women who have an onset of dysmenorrhea after age 25, women who have abnormal pelvic exam findings, women who have a history of infertility or menstrual abnormalities. A lot of times women with secondary dysmenorrhea will have a heavier flow. Not all the time, though. Women who have dyspareunia. So women with primary dysmenorrhea will typically not have dyspareunia. It's only pain associated with menstruation. And then women who don't respond to conventional therapy for primary dysmenorrhea. So what do we do for workup? Well, you want to get a good history and physical. So as far as your history, you want to get a family history. A lot of women with primary dysmenorrhea, their sibling's mother will also have primary dysmenorrhea or a history thereof. You want to know her obstetric history, and the reason for that is because another cause of chronic pelvic pain is pelvic organ prolapse, which you're more likely to get if you have had more children. And sexual history. So one of the big causes of chronic pelvic pain is pelvic inflammatory disease. So if she has a history of gonorrhea, uh, that's something we want to know, obviously and we're going to culture her if she does have uh, a recent history of having sex with somebody, um, if it's unprotected. Okay, review of systems. Uh, obviously, you want to get that because you want to know if there's any associated symptoms uh, besides the pelvic pain. You want to get a physical examination, especially a pelvic exam. Don't defer that. Uh, you want to look at her anatomy you want to see if there's any obstruction, especially in a younger woman, 16, 17 years of age. You want to see if there's any anatomic abnormalities. You want to feel for masses. 
Uh, labs, you want to get a urine pregnancy test in any woman who presents complaining of pelvic pain. That is a rule. You always get a pregnancy test in a woman complaining of pelvic pain. In select patients, those with a recent sexual history, unprotected sex, multiple partners, uh, you'll get chlamydia and gonococcal swabs. And then other labs you'll get as indicated by the clinical picture. So if there's a CVA tenderness or if she has pain on urination, obviously you're going to get a urinalysis with culture. If there's a mass, you want to visualize it, you can get a transvaginal ultrasound. Like I said, pregnancy must always be excluded in a woman presenting with pelvic pain. All right, now this is a menstrual diary, and this is useful for women who have an unclear association between when their pain is happening and when their menstrual cycle is, where they're at in their menstrual cycle. Now this is a rather rudimentary menstrual diary that I have up here for you, uh, but there are other ones that can, she can plot when she's having her menstrual flow, when she's having her pain, and then also any other symptoms she's having on that particular day. And this becomes very useful in distinguishing dysmenorrhea from something else that looks rather similar and can be a cause of pelvic pain, but is something that we treat a little bit differently, and that is premenstrual syndrome, PMS. And a lot of these women will have pain, but they'll also have other symptoms. And these symptoms tend to happen in the luteal phase, the two weeks leading up to the period. So what are the other symptoms that women with PMS have? They will often have mood swings, tenderness in their breasts. Uh, they can have irritability, maybe even depression. A lot of them will describe food cravings. Maybe they're a little bit more tired than usual. Sometimes they'll have diarrhea, nausea, constipation, a whole variety of symptoms. And so a woman may have pain with menstruation, but if she's having these other symptoms in the two weeks leading up to her period, then this fits more of a diagnosis of PMS. And we treat this differently. With dysmenorrhea, we treat the pain. With PMS, we tend to treat it with SSRIs. Uh, so you want to know the difference between these two for any licensing examination. It's very important you know the difference between these two because they're treated differently. So our treatment for primary dysmenorrhea is going to be NSAIDs. This is our first line of treatment. And uh, we go for these because they inhibit prostaglandins. They inhibit the production of prostaglandins. And prostaglandins are what's causing the pain. So it makes sense that we go for NSAIDs as our first line of therapy. So ibuprofen is time-tested, works really well. Uh, give her 400 milligrams of ibuprofen to take every four to six hours, and that works wonderfully. About 80 to 90 percent of women will respond to NSAIDs. Another one is naproxen. You can use that, 500 milligrams. Uh, when her period starts, then go 250 milligrams uh, every six to eight hours. Uh, some of these other ones, melanamic acid, also known as Ponsto, and Ketoprofen, uh, aren't used so much. Now, if she can't take NSAIDs, uh, maybe because she's got uh, a, an ulcer or acid reflux or something, she doesn't want to take NSAIDs, she can take other things. Combined oral contraceptives can be used, or she can use progestin-only contraceptives. Uh, she can use the uh, levonorgestrel device. Uh, so there are lots of more steroidal uh, contraceptives uh, that she can take. So uh, these can be used in women who either don't want to take NSAIDs, aren't supposed to take NSAIDs, or they don't respond to NSAIDs, or it can be used as a first line of therapy in women who also want contraception. So if a woman wants contraception, then you can kill two birds with one stone. It can help with her menstrual pain, and it can also provide contraception. Uh, however, NSAIDs are the best answer when, ask, when answering a question. You have a woman with dysmenorrhea, what do we do for treatment? The answer is NSAIDs. Second line is combined oral contraceptives. Okay, so let's do another vignette. This one's a little bit different, and I want you to see what's different here and what this might be. 
And this is where a menstrual diary can also be useful. So here we have another 17-year-old girl who's presenting to your clinic complaining of crampy lower abdominal and pelvic pain that comes and goes every month. But with her, the pain is predictably, uh, pre predictable and lasts about 12 to 24 hours. And usually it's either on the left or right side, but not both. After a normal physical exam and exclusion of pregnancy via urine HCG, you send her home with a menstrual diary to record her episodes of pain and follow up in two months. Two months later, she returns to your clinic, and when you review her diary, you find that her pain is indeed predictable and comes about two weeks before her menses. What is the diagnosis here? You will get a question, possibly get a question, on the test about this, and you want to be familiar with this concept. This is Mittelschmerz. Mittelschmerz is German for middle pain, and it comes in the mid-cycle, so two weeks before she uh, menstruates, during ovulation. And this is classically a one-sided lower abdominal pain that coincides with ovulation and comes on the side where she's ovulating from. The precise mechanism for this pain is unknown. Uh, it's possibly due to a release of fluid or blood from the antrum of the follicle, which then irritates the lining of the abdomen, but we're not exactly sure why this happens. It can last anywhere from a few minutes up to 48 hours. Usually it's going to be the women that it happens a little bit longer in that, you're, that, that are going to come in, so more like a day or two. The treatment here is quite simple. It's over-the-counter analgesics. A lot of women, this is not a huge deal for them because it only lasts for a short period of time. But they will describe this as a sharp or crampy abdominal pain. And so if they do come in with this and you find that it is a cyclical pain that comes in the middle of their cycles, two weeks before their period, the diagnosis is middle schmerz. And we treat this with over-the-counter analgesics, NSAIDs, Tylenol, etc.